Hey everyone, I'm Chris Rebel, and let's rock and roll. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Chris Rebel, host of Let's Chat with Chris Rebel, and welcome tonight to tonight's punk rock doc filmmakers roundtable. Uh, tonight's roundtable will be a discussion with four punk rock documentary filmmakers sharing their journey of the process of documentary filmmaking. I'll be your host this evening. We'll introduce you to our, pan our panelists, and we'll share some of the trailers for the work in momentarily. Uh, we will be having a Q&A portion after the roundtable, so please direct all of your questions, your comments to the Let's Chat with Chris Rebel uh, Facebook or YouTube page. Uh, the wonderful Chris Ball is our behind-the-scenes guy tonight, so thank you, Chris Ball. Um, he's going to be in our chat room, so feel free to keep hitting up those comments. And uh, do us a huge favor while you're at it. Tweet, take some pictures of this, make us look silly, share it around, share this, uh, share it on the social media while you have it up. And uh, we're going to just um, be, be great. Uh, so we can, and now we're going to bring on our, uh, we're going to bring our filmmakers on. Uh, first, we have John Nix, director of Beyond Barricades. Hi, how's it going? Hey, John. Excellent. Then next, we have Scott Crawford, the director of Salad Days and Cream Doc. Hey, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Next up, Taylor Morton, director of Pick It Up Scott in the 90s and The Black Lost Buster. Hey, John. Hey. And finally, we have Sean Michael Cologne, director of A Fat Wreck and the upcoming podcast documentary Age of Audio. Sean, how are you, buddy? I'm here. Excellent. Uh, I can't thank you enough for all of you, for your time, uh, for your work, for what you've done to, to highlight these the works that would have definitely, I mean, let's be honest, uh, a lot of these things may not have been seen anywhere else. So from the bottom of my heart and anyone listening and watching and hearing this, uh, thank you so much. Um, so the reason we're here today um, that we put this together, the role of the documentary filmmaker is to act as the avatar for the audience and show us the stories that have otherwise been overlooked. With the popularity of streaming services and crowdfunding, it is safe to say that we are in the golden age of documentaries right now. Tonight, we are here, to, we are here in the spirit of punk rock to celebrate these four filmmakers who've shared their stories about the communities that we all love so much and lift each other up. Uh, our panelist, John Mix, is actually having his premiere tomorrow, so we're all here definitely to, uh, to rally up for John uh, for Beyond Barricades. That is uh, premiering on antiflag.com. Yeah, John. Uh, there are tickets available. I, please, please get them. Um, I know for that you can get some. There's a, some you can rent it to watch it live, and you know there's also uh, a Q and A and a moderating panel that you have doing afterwards. So uh, antiflag.beeps.com. Make sure you support them. And uh, John, so let's first before we do anything, John, let's see the show for Beyond Barricades. <laughs> I was just blown away by the, the unapologetic political ferocity of the show. Not a huge amount of American bands that, that have such a strong political content in their music. You gotta die, gotta die, gotta die for the government, die for the country, that shit! I wanted to name the band Anti-Flag because every time corrupt politicians want to start a war, they pull out the flag. I'm sure all of them never thought they'd be doing this for a living. You've got Pat, who is personally really on the front lines of political activism. And then you have Chris, number one, who is the, the strong, silent type. And then number two is, of course, the, you know, the fiery, leapfrogging punk presence. And then Justin, who is the heart and soul of the band. Uh, it was the first time that I realized that someone from our town could make songs that people would care about. They're always on tour. They're, for 20 years, they've been on tour. It could go tragically wrong at any moment. The stress of going on tour every year comes more than most relationships can handle. And then you come home and they're like, no, a lot of shit has happened and you haven't been here for a while. It turned into, we have reach and power. We should care about more. We should be grandiose. We have a message, listen to it. I want to write songs and talk to people who are interested in activism and politics and think that the world can be different than it is right now. If that's not your thing, go away. Get the fuck out. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. One, two, three. Oh, 
Oh my god. Uh, I, I, I've seen that movie. Uh, I've gotten to see it already, and it's really fucking good. Uh, you knocked it out of the park. Uh, so, John, uh, first question for you actually is like, what was your relationship to um, what was your relationship to the subject matter of anti fly prior to uh, making Beyond Barricades? Um, I, I didn't know them personally at all. I knew them through a friend, uh, Chris Stowe, who I met in Cleveland when he lived here, but now he's the label manager for AF Records. Um, and so that's how I got into it. I mean, I always knew about them. You know, I, I bought a couple of their CDs in high school and I always kind of had, um, you know, a ton of respect for what they did and their message. Uh, I was always pretty politically active. Um, but like, I just, it, they, were, they were never one of my like big, big bands. But then once uh, we got the opportunity to do this, like Stowe basically offered us uh, like a giant uh, like storage tub full of tapes, like VHSs and mini DV tapes. And was like, do you think you can make something out of this? And once we started reviewing the footage, uh, we definitely could see that there would be like a good story there. And so I dove back in and especially like there's a middle run of records in like the center of their career that like I really connected to once I like reexamined them uh, with like a more active eye, like looking for like if there was a story there or not. Oh, that's wonderful. And so you said Cleveland, so you're from Ohio area? Yeah, yeah. We're uh, like our production company space out of Cleveland, Ohio. And, and and so you grew up in the Ohio scene. Um. Well. Y- yes. Yeah. yeah. I grew up in Florida, but it, like I didn't really go to shows until I moved to Ohio. Oh, nice, excellent. Oh, oh, wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much for being here today. Um. So the next up, we yeah, got Scott Cro- we got Scott Crawford with. Uh, we're gonna run the trailer for Salad Days. Oh, can I just? <laughs> that I would get nervous around, you know? Like I know that Ian is a normal dude or HR or whatever, they're just normal dudes. Those fucking people changed my life. DC is a small city of 400, 500,000 people. The industry is government. So the thing about Washington is that it's a petri dish for great ideas. They may not be sustainable, but you can always grow something here because nobody's looking. We're proud as hell of the fact that what's coming out of this town is good. When you think about, you know, what kind of a town Washington, D.C. was at that point, that's kind of, that was kind of a remarkable thing. And we knew it. Everyone knew it. Just brilliant, energetic, creative people. And no one seems intent on having a career of any kind. Oh, we can watch it twice. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Oh, so, uh, hey, Scott, uh, man, thank you uh, so much for being here as well. Um, you know, kind of same kind of question. Just like, what was your relationship to uh, that scene prior to this film? Yeah, well, first off, I want to say that that anti, the, the anti flag doc looks amazing. I'm such a big fan of that band. And, and I know good. Justin. And uh, oh, thank Justin, you. Justin used to write for me when I did a magazine. He used to write a column for me. It was a political column. So, um, yeah, I love that band. So, um, but, it, uh, so, uh, kudos to you, but, uh, but, uh, as far as, uh, salad days. Yeah. I mean, that was like my, um, coming of age. I mean, I, that was the eighties. Uh, I started going to shows late 83, 84. So I was, well, I'm not going to tell you how old I was, but I was very young. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, had a long, my, my mother gave me a long leash and, uh, I was able to, uh, to go and sort of, uh, see this stuff, uh, up close and, you know, it, it changed my life. So, um, you know, it was, it's something that's informed my life in so many ways. I'm still that same kid that I was 
at 12 and, you know, still working on that. I got it. <laughs> you know, it's not always, <laughs> not always cool to be that 12 year old when you're my age. But, um, but, uh, ah, he didn't even say his age. That's how old he is. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed that? I threw a dance like when that. you're, uh, uh, my age, as old as I am, whatever that may be, that particular age, what it may be. Sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was originally like started. I, I, I had, uh, you know, I'd done, I'd done magazine. Sorry. I did a fanzine when I was a kid. Um, I did that for almost four years. And it was a very sort of DC centric fanzine at the time. And then it, 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 went beyond that and I was interviewing who's Du and dead Kennedy's and toxic reasons and you name it, you know, whatever was going those on. Small bands. What's that? Those small little bands. Yeah. Those small little bands that no one cared about. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and so I was just a little kid going up with like the little recorder going, Hey, can I record you? And, um, so, um, anyway, all that stuff kind of like just took, went on the back burner for 20 years. And, and, uh, and then I was doing this magazine and, um, 2008, 2008, the magazine went under just like a ton of other magazines in 2008. I don't know if one remembers, um, but you know, vibe spin me, you know, and anyway, so, um, I started to think about a book. And I thought, you know, this would make a hell of a book because it's kind of a coming of age story. Mm. Yeah, because I'm I'm literally coming of age during. I mean, I went from mm. seeing Void to seeing Fugazi. So I saw Void in the early '80s, and then seeing Fugazi, or actually playing in a band and opening for Fugazi by the end of the '80s. So it was really this, you know, arc that was that was kind of nice and. Uh, and then I realized, well, doing the, do, you know, writing a book is doesn't do the music justice because you're leaving out the music. And that's that's the best part. You know, it's one of the best parts. So that's when I, you know, re sort of uh, considered how to tell the story. And uh, my old friend, Jim Saw, um, who I had been friends with uh, since a kid when I was doing the zine because he was a photographer. Mm. I approached him and said, Hey man, you know, this needs to be, this story needs to be told. And I was shocked that it hadn't been told yet, you know? And, um, long story short, it took us about three years, three and a half years to do it. And, um, and then it just took on a life of its own. So it, I'm still, I'm, I'm really proud of it. it and I think it's safe to say, and I'm sure yeah. everyone in the panel would agree that this, it's kind of become the gold standard of like that era for, for docs for a while. It was, um, what was it? But yeah, and it seems to be the one because you hear that most of the people is like the go-to of our of our community to reference. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate that. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, hey, podcast. Uh, oh, Sean, what's up, bud? I, I, no, I got to say this. As you're telling that story, it I, I don't know if any Judd Apatow fans, we got any Judd Apatow fans in the room? Anyone? Oh yeah. Okay. I know good, what you're, good. Thinking. All right. you're like the Judd Apatow of DC. You're like the Judd Apatow of DC hardcore. He, like he, like <laughs> what he did with comedy, he went he and just very he young. Yeah, those. Right. He's like, yeah, we, I'm doing an interview. Yeah. And then he did all that. And then he later on, he you know started making stuff about it. And you know, so you're like, uh, so you're you're like the Judd Apatow of DC hardcore. I just didn't. <laughs> I, didn't I, I guess when you're that young, you're fearless to an extent. So I didn't have any problem calling, you know, Ian Mackay or Alec Mackay or any of these people and just going, you know, hey, I'm this guy, I'm this little kid and I'm doing this thing. Can you do an interview? And you got to remember that was 35 years ago. So at that point, when you're um, when anyone is asking to do an interview with you, when you think no one else is paying attention, um, I think. I think they were all, you know, wonderful with their time and very patient with me because I was some of the world's dumbest questions. So, um, you know, uh, I'm still very thankful. What was the dumbest question you asked? What was the dumbest question you asked? Uh, I don't know. uh, How much time do you have? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I think we have about an hour. As as <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just ask things like, you know, do you skate? You know, just like, just like really hor- It's just, yeah. it's more, it's mortifying to talk about, you know, just do you skate? Why? Do I you know, like- that's why I talk about it. I want to make you feel you- real uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I'm already there. Um, do you like straight edge? You know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just horrible stuff, you know. But um, and so when I approached him all those years later, I think there was a certain. I don't know. It. I, I think with DC, I don't know about. I can't speak for the rest of the country, but DC is very. I don't know if it's just the DNA of the the, the politics or the sort of uh, just general distrust of people. But I do think that helped in making the film, knowing that, you know, you know, being able to say, hey, I remember that. And then, oh, yeah, you know, like, and I had stayed friends, you know, with, I mean, a lot of the people in the films I was still friends with. I mean, we would still hang out like, you know, yeah, it it wasn't that hard. You had like you had street cred. (laughs) You had street cred. Well, I don't know about that, but I, but yeah, no, whatever. You're like, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, like you, you, you were around when it was happening. You weren't like you, you like you were actually there when it was happening. I mean, you're, you pop yeah. up in the documentary as a little kid a few times. Yeah. Well, well, that well I guess for a good section, but that was sort of for context, just to let folks know, like, who is this guy and why does this guy think he can make a film about DC punk rock? You know, um, I think that, um, you know, that, uh having that relationship with those folks and um if i had just been a complete outsider i'm not sure i could be wrong but i'm not sure if i would have gotten the same kind of um not not just access but just uh honesty that mm-hmm. i got because i think that yeah. i think right. dc in particular is very you know close to the vest. Mm-hmm. We're not going to like divulge too much. We're going to just, you know, and, um, and, uh, so, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I feel very lucky that I was able to, uh, to get the kind of access and kind of, um, uh, answers and, uh, uh, responses that I got. Um, you know, I yeah. watched it. You know, so anyway, absolutely. Yeah, if anyone, obviously, anyone should go watch these if you haven't. Um, so from going from anti flag uh, to the DC scene, let's go to the next national progression to Taylor, uh, who made a documentary about Ska. Pick it up, Scott, Scott. of pick course. It pick it up in the pick it up, Scott. In the I, know, I, I feel like that's real. I, I, I got, you got like uh, because of like Operation Ivy, Operation Ivy is like go. around that same time. There's a little bit of an overlap with the DC hardcore time frame when that was oh, happening awesome. late '80s. Over on the uh, on the West Coast, you got you got some of the the early stages of uh, some of that kind of uh, ska music, start, like punk ska, kind of starting to come. Yeah, together. absolutely. That's, where, yeah, that's yeah, why you're here, punk rock. That's, that's how it connects. That's yeah, why the yeah, ska yeah. guy can stay. So let's uh, let's run that trailer so people can see what we're talking about, and uh, and then they. Can- And now the curtain has gone up on another unique attraction, ska music. Pick it up. Back then, it was like the people that liked the music loved the music. We got lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. Holy sh**. Ska music? Do you know anything about ska music? Ska music? Never heard of it. This is so different and so weird, and my parents are going to hate it. Anything goes. I remember just going, what the f***? What is this? Wow, there's a music out there where it just makes me feel positive. It makes me feel good. If I could define a music for the mid-90s, it was ska punk. The world was ready for fun music. Everything ska was moving off the shelf. This is bigger than our little thing. This is something next level. All of a sudden, new metal was cool, and ska is not cool. Like, 99, it was like, bam, nobody went to ska shows. This is terrible. The way it exploded is the way it died. It was like, one day it was all there, then it was gone. The great thing about ska is that, like, punk rock, there's always going to be a subculture for what we do. Ska equates to unity to me. 
That's what I loved about it. Cause you had black, white, Mexican, Asian. Nobody was against anyone for that moment in time. Man, I'll tell you, music needs more of that. Music needs more of that. This world needs more of that. in the 90s. Clever like and energetic. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could keep up with them. Oh, no, that's good music, though. Toe nice. tapping. Oh, Chandler, man, you're, I'm sure you guys all have the same thing where that, that, that trailer alone just made me start skanking here in my chair. I was like, man. <laughs> oh. I, I started skanking, but I didn't want to break a hip. <laughs> uh, so uh, Taylor, like, what's your relationship to Scott? He's, like, a, man, Scott, he's, he's a punk of a certain age. <laughs> um, I'm a ska fan and I'm a ska musician. I've played in ska bands off and on since the late 90s. Um, kind of owe most of my best friendships in life to ska music. You know, I, it, it, I was a band geek before that. So it kind of brought me out into the world and I met a bunch of cool people, got to tour all over the world and do really cool stuff. And then kind of fell out of the ska scene for a while in the mid early two thousands and then started playing again, actually in Washington, DC. Oh uh, around, yeah. Around 2010 and got back into ska like, I don't know, not a lot, but it was, it was a cool scene there. And it was like, it was meeting people who shared that, like, oh, yeah. this never went away. This is a really cool thing. And, um, you know, just, it's still this really important musical genre to me. It's really like a huge part of my life. And then I became a filmmaker years later. I started with a not very ska documentary and then uh, this was my second go at it. What was the uh, what was the name of the band in the, in uh, DC? It was a band called the Shifters. The Shifters, okay. Yeah, it was like a rock steady um, trad ska kind of band. We played um, played like the Blue Beat Nights in uh, Adams Morgan a lot. Right. Yep. Did you ever play like Black Cat or any mm -hmm. of them? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we played Nine Thirty with the Boss Tones. Oh, nice. Thanks for calling me, but yeah, I would have been there. You were invited. I mean, where were you? It was, let's see, 2013. It was a Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not sure. Can't recall. But uh, yeah, I bet that was a hell of a show. It was. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> I've seen the Boss Tones a bunch of times. And, and that movie, that tra I, I, now it's one more movie I've got to go see. Um, I remember seeing... Uh, Bad Manners, um, you know, one of my favorite bands, uh, in the eighties. And I saw them probably 1985, maybe. And I'll never forget. I like, I literally knew every lyric to every song and fatty blood best, you know, was it, was it fatty blood bus buster? Is that his name? Fatty Buster blood vessel. Thank you. Okay. He, um, grabbed the drumstick from the drummer. And when it was all over, he handed it to me. And, um, you know, just as sort of an acknowledgement, like this little dorky kid knows who we, who we are. And the, do you remember the key? Did you ever see Bad Manners? No. Okay. A little well, bit before my time. Uh, okay, gotcha. Well, well, the, the keyboardist would, he had a drooling problem. And okay. um, so uh, there was a towel that he kept. Uh, at the end of his, uh, it was like on the side of his keyboard. And as he would play, he would get so into it that he would drool. Just, it would just, it was like a dog, like just, <laughs> and he would just clean himself off and keep playing. And it, But by the end of the uh, set, the, uh, yeah, I, I, there may have been several towels. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. So, but no, that, that's, that looks like a great movie, man. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I yeah. absolutely loved it. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, I I really liked it. Um, I'm generally not a ska fan. Like I I really enjoy it live. Um, I've incidentally seen Less Than Jake like three times by accident. Um, sure. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I really liked it. I, I was by really accident. impressed with like. <laughs> I understand. I've seen a lot of bands by accident. You know, they were always just opening for bands I, that I really liked. And I'm just like, oh, I guess I'm going to see Less Than Jake again. All right. right. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought you, it was really something cool. I think the way you managed to like balance how many interviews are going on in there and then the animation, like everything, everything's great. I was really impressed. It's definitely got too many people in it. And that yeah, I mean, was, it's got, um, yeah, it's got a lot. Figured it out as we went along, but then, you know, you, it's like you a get band. It's like, it's, yeah, it's like a ska band. <laughs> it's like too many people. No, but that's exactly like a ska band. You a ska band right. has like way too many people in it. It's like a that's metaphor right. for right. ska <laughs> bands. And I, I have always you exactly what you're supposed to do. I've always <laughs> loved the idea of a ska documentary because you've got, there's so much, there's such a rich history there. And you've got, you know, uh, it's also the story of race as well. And so I, you know, that's such a, you know, um, such a great uh, potential, you know, the narrative there is is huge and you can go any number of directions. And uh, from, from that trailer trailer, uh, it it looks like, you know, certainly like that you nailed it. So anyway, I can confirm it. Uh, you did nail it, in fact. And uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, like a lot of all your films, like by the end of it, you, um, uh, it just, um, by the end of it, it just really, you felt good. You know, I somehow like, kind of like, like, like a good documentary should introduce you to something you might know nothing about or something about. I definitely feel like I learned a lot, but mm-hmm. I felt happy by the end of it. And by, I found your Spotify playlist of the, and, and so I was listening to that all day and kind of redigging through some old Scott records that I could find. Um, oh, but yeah, thank you for coming on. So uh, the next, uh, last but not least, we're going to introduce our buddy, Sean Michael Cologne, uh, uh, the director of A Fat Rack and the future podca- uh, future documentary, Age of Audio. Uh, let's, can we, let's see the Fat Rack. Future documentary. Yeah. Thanks. That's a nice way of saying that. <laughs> Wearing fucking Argyle pants and a mohawk. Who the fuck has a mohawk anymore? That dude. <laughs> hey, it's that Mike. I play no effects. In the very beginning, no effects was not good. When my ex-wife and I, Aaron, first started Fat Records, we had no idea what the fuck we were doing. Like none. It was me and her in an apartment in a fax machine in a closet. I went to school for creative writing. Mike majored in philosophy. Like we don't. I don't know how to fucking run a record label. It just so happened the first four or five bands I signed were really good. Everybody sold a lot of records. Oh, that Mike started a label, Fat Records. How ingenious. It's the only record label that's ever paid me. And that's awesome. It was just like the most ramped up partying ever, but it probably took like 30 years off my life. Yeah, Proper Gandhi talked shit about me in a song I don't know. Sometimes you don't think too much about something, you know? You're just jamming, making the song. I'm lucky to have these bands on my label. It's kind of silly to say, but like I learned shit from reading good written slayer. You just can't even, like, I got, go- look at Goosebumps. I'm not kidding. There's Goosebumps. Fat Records is more than just a label that's putting out records. It's an ethics. You know, when, when someone says it's not personal, it's business. Fuck you. It's a lifestyle. You know, when I sign a new band, we end up hanging out a lot and drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs together. It's a family. It's about chosen families. This is our family. Fat Records needs us. Like fucking moms and dads and brothers and sisters. Maybe it was like a family, but to me it appeared more like a mafia. The most melodic and the most rocking and the most fun, played by the coolest people. You know, it's not like one thing 
that you could just say like this, Fat America's legacy. But if there was, you know, I don't know what it would be, you know. Oh, Sean, uh, same thing. I watched your, I watched that trailer. I just kind of it makes me want to start like uh, throwing it out in the pit. Um, so, what was your relationship to uh, Fat Rack prior to making this film? Hey, Sean, uh, are you uh, you are on mute? Okay, I think so. We're having a couple of. Sean's not here, man. There he is. <laughs> Uh, say that one more time. Hey, so uh, Sean, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've seen your film, a uh, huge fan as well. Say that uh, one more time. <laughs> what's your what was your relationship to um, a fat wreck prior to making this uh, making this look? Um, I had a couple small things. I had a studio that I had uh, a few years prior to uh, filming the movie like had invited uh joey cape of Lagwagon fame to our studio that we had in dallas here and he accepted and came and recorded a free we recorded a song with him for free and uh he was in my uh just kind of like someone that i had met and knew but i didn't talk to him very often mm. and um and i had fat records from since i was like 13 or 14 probably 14 i guess maybe, maybe 15 somewhere in like 15 16 age you know when you start getting into music and uh i mean uh, my my whole thought process was that uh I, I think this is around the time like a bunch of punk rock docs were hitting netflix like a band called death and some of the older docs like american hardcore and um you know um what's it uh the decline of western civilization stuff like that and uh, as me and a buddy were getting into film stuff, um, we we're trying to think about something to make for like a short. And I was like, no one ever talks about like back 90s kind of punk rock and documentaries. It's all the documentaries are like in the 80s when the old men like Scott were hanging out and everyone, it was really violent. <laughs> so violent. What was your, what's with your generation being so violent at punk rock shows? Not you individually, but there was a lot of violence in the eighties, and I think that, it it like horrible. all the documentaries are like how like like you go to a punk show, you get your head bashed in, and that just was Pretty not much. my experience. I had a very like you know it's the the after effects of that, the people who yeah. uh, the no effects of that, if you will. Oh, um, I, I, like I think, just, I think just was not. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry for that. I I think Fugazi helped with that. Say again, Scott. I, I said I think Fugazi helped. Yeah, with that. I mean, I mean, I will say that. Yeah, I, I think said, I think there was a, a. Oh, I was just gonna say I was at an American Nightmare show, like probably right before shutdown, and I got spin kicked in the face, almost got knocked out. <laughs> so <laughs> it's still definitely right. that pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but like I, the fat wreck kind of the fat. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Scott, go Scott. It, it really doesn't matter. Your story's way better. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh no! Well, I for you. Uh, I've said this shit so many times. Uh, I, I, some, oh man, I, that's why I wanted to talk with you guys. So I get like hear you know about. I, I, I'm even connecting things right now. That that's right. That's that kind of thing that like no effects. You know those bands were kind of. That's what they grew up in, and right. like the kind of punk rock they made was almost like a reaction to that. Like we don't want right. to like. You know, I mean, there's elements of sexism, but it wasn't the same of like, like assaulting girl women or like right. being just being like super scumbag drug addicts a lot of times. Not everybody, obviously, but you know, there's a, like there's just a, that element, and I feel like they kept the drugs, but they got rid of the violence. Yeah, <laughs> is it uh, is because like they, they definitely have the drugs. Uh, you know, puppets doing drugs. You know, uh, they, yeah, the the amount of how drugs are kind of like in integral to that but um I, yeah I, I, like i, I said i was i was were those real drugs used on the puppets because that's like a waste of good <laughs> <laughs> no of course not for legal for legal liability reasons i wouldn't even know how to get those kind okay. of drugs um, um just thought i'd start out <laughs> <laughs> I knew. it's movie magic 
<laughs> right. Okay. Uh, there's no drugs in movies. Wow. <laughs> entertainment, people doing drugs in entertainment. I can't, even, that, what kind of world would we live in? Uh, but then, yeah, like, so like that, it was really just a kind of a, my reaction to like, I liked seeing those documentaries and uh, I just never saw that a certain kind of punk rock that I had grown up with was not represented. It's just not, you know, and I, I think that's, I, if anything, I think that's why the movie uh, probably resonated with a certain group of people who did, had not seen that. I, I got a lot of emails of people being say thank you. And I, I never get to see, you know, the kind of our, our favorite bands on the screen. It's usually like, you know, so yeah, I mean, it was, uh, and there's so much there's so much you know to you make a documentary you find out so many things and there's so much yeah. to discover and so like being able to you know uh show aaron and her you know here's this fat records this kind of this boys club thing and here behind the scenes is this woman kind of running like really running the show like in, in a in a very like financial and logistical kind of way you know so so yeah the, 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 that, the, that was that sufficient to your question your grilling it's got you journalism, Chris. I gotcha. Hey, I didn't ask you about the uh, stilettos, so I feel like you should be happy. <laughs> I I oh, thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you guys did do that? How many of you guys uh, had to do get into uh, stilettos into uh, into a pool to to do your documentary? Um, I think there's so many. Um, <laughs> the blockbuster doc is bless yeah. your definitely the blockbuster doc i'm sure they're like you can't come yeah. into the store unless you wear stuff yeah dress code you, that's why everything everyone sh everything everything shot up from the waist up underneath everyone had <laughs> yeah doctor yet so i assume that's all shot from the waist up. it's actually all shot from the waist down it's a weird <laughs> well weird I, that is sexy that's a that's a new approach i have this new approach can you tell a story like that? It's it's like uh, yeah. like that's what I'm gonna do in my next doc. It's all feet and legs, no faces. And like Marantino. the nervousness. No, I'll be first in one. face. I don't know what the Sean. Hey, uh, Sean. I don't know if you can hear us. Yeah. No, I glitched out. I got—I don't know. Maybe my internet's the worst. Okay. You guys are doing so good. I was so—I've been so impressed. Um, I'll be right back. What was your question there, Chris? Oh no, that—that's the stilettos. Um, so here's something I kind of want to throw out to the group. I'm just kind of curious about. Um, you know, when Scott comes back as well, we just not let him jump right in. Um, so, like, what would you say? Do you uh, have any of your uh, the DIY scene ethics or skill set that you picked up from going to shows or being a musician? Did you find transferred over when it became to um, making a movie? Like, was there a, any crossover? Because you know, you're, I guess, I guess, what in filmmaking you call guerrilla frame, like guerrilla filmmaking, but for our, our world, we call, I, I always think of it more like DIY. Yeah, I, I still call it DIY. It's, I think it all, it all translates. You know, like I grew up playing in bands and making our own flyers at Kinkos and going and putting them up and you know, screen printing our own t-shirts and doing all that. And I still like to this day, if I get a movie for or an order for a Blu-ray on my website, I go to my garage, grab one out, put it in the thing and put a sticker in there and ship it out myself. It's all, it's totally DIY. And the same thing, you know, I, I, I don't know how the rest of these guys shot their movies, but a lot of times it was just me setting up a camera, setting up a microphone, setting up a light and then moving a little bit and like, you know, driving we did. We shot the first week of the Scott documentary. We shot it like I was on tour and we went around Southern California, slept on people's couches and people's floors and just, you know, it's totally DIY. That's fucking awesome. It's exactly yeah, the same. As, you know, music and movies are not that different. Okay. I agree with that. I like wholeheartedly. I, like, uh, I mean, I, I I found editing, like if you have had been in music uh, and you've done music editing, like, you know, like if you've been, it's this, the, the, the concept's the same. And also, and, and this, I talked to John, uh, like we had a, a podcast episode with John. So I want to get your take on this as well, because I think other people would like to hear it. But mm -hmm. um, like as a musician, the way that I, when I have a scene that's cut, it, there's a musicality to it. And also like a, a crescendo and like there's, but there's like, there's, there's a, I can listen to it. I can watch it 
like a, I would listen to a song. I can just listen to, watch it over and over again. It's kind of how that things are starting to fall in place because I can actually like watch it over and over again, like like I would a song. And I was like, okay, that song's done. Let me move on to the next one, sort of thing. It's got the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's got that same feeling that I get when I'm writing a song and it's going through that process. When it's so it, the feelings are very similar. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I I don't like I said before. I don't I don't do music. I'm I think I'm the only one here. Um, but it's not dissimilar from writing and it's definitely it's definitely like music in the sense that everyone has their own pacing and their own rhythm that they speak in. And I think a lot about cutting in like an interview with someone in an effective way is about that rhythm and knowing how to make it work within like other people's rhythms. And so that's really how you get to build those sequences out is like, if you have a person that's slow, but they get to a really good point, you need to figure out how to like build that moment up. And then you can intersperse, you know, fast talkers and all that stuff in between there and kind of break up the momentum. But yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely, it's, I'm sh- sure it's, I, mean, I feel like songs are just kind of a smaller microcosm. Like I definitely think about that when I listen to songs or li- I, when I listen to albums, especially like the, I'm always yeah. fascinated by like tracking and like how you uh, think about ordering all your songs and what, where do you need like your emotional breath and your breaks? And then where do you think you can like sustain like a big seven minute piece and whatever else like that? Um, like all that stuff is super fascinating to me. And I always end up thinking about it in an editing kind of way. Exactly. Hey, yeah. Scott, in case you missed the question, Scott. Um, There's yeah, a great, uh, thank you. I had a bathroom break. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, no problem. Um, we were just asking, uh, what, oh, uh, DIY, nice. what DIY um, scene ethics or skill set would you say that you learned from growing up in the punk scene that you that kind of transferred over to um, filmmaking? That's a really, really good question, and I think yes, Sorry. you know, I thought I thought a lot about this, and I think that um, having done. A fanzine, having started a band, having been a part of a scene that was so supportive of doing it yourself before that became part of the sort of American vernacular, you know, DIY, um, and just giving you that license um, and that courage, you know, to do that, I think is, is really, you know, I'm not sure if I would have, I certainly had the editorial background. I I knew how to do that. I knew how to tell a story. I knew how to edit a story, but I didn't know how to shoot one. So I, but I had it, you know, I had it up here and I thought, well, um, I know the right, I know the people that could, like the 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 people that I wanted to work with, I knew were very good at what they did, and so I knew between what what I was able to bring and what they could bring, it would be like literally like something you know that I would have thought about doing thirty years previously, where you just go, okay, um, this is what I'm going to do, and we're going to start next week. <laughs> And, um, and that's what we did. And, you know, it's not to say I didn't do my research, you know, I mean, I, you know, I spent every night doing my homework for, for months and months and months on how to, you know, do a documentary. Um, so it's not to diminish that, but, but I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm probably not saying it very succinctly, but I think what I'm trying to say is, Had I not gone through that period, that really important period of of coming of age, of growing up, seeing other people do things that I never thought in a million years I could do, just tackling it head on, just saying, no, we're going to do this. And like, fuck it. Like, I I can, I'll figure it out. I'll, 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 I'll just make it happen. Uh, do the work and make it happen. And that's kind of like my, you know, that's my work. Uh, you know, sort of, that's just how I, that's how I work today. You know, I don't work any differently. And, um, and I think so, you know, it served me, it served me well. 
And I think that if I had not had that, that experience growing up of people patting you on the back and saying, you can do this, you got this. Like, you don't like, yeah. And then I'd say, yeah, but I don't, I've never done it before. And then they'd sort of give you the license to say, it doesn't matter whether you've done it before you can do this. And so I kind of, you know, if I hadn't had that growing up, I'm not sure, you know, what I'd be doing right now. But, um, but I can say that um, having that kind of support and that, that, um, that, uh, you know, pat on the back and that sort of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, you've got this. Um, I don't think I could do what I'm doing right now at all. So I think, I think, I think that, and I don't think that that unusual of a story. I think anyone on this panel would could probably say the same thing. What it may not be the same sort of uh, story, but I think knowing punk rock, being a part of it, once you understood it, because a lot, you know it takes a little bit. Like you're like, you know, what is this all about? And then once you figure it out, you go, oh, okay, I get it. It's about like throwing out the old stuff, creating your own thing and moving forward and doing the work. And, um, I was lucky enough to learn that at a, at a really uh, early age. I'll say this. I have, I have a, I have a hey, I think we should kind of tack on to that. Well, it's, it's a visual. I think it's a good visual, you know, it's like, I, I'm like, sir, please, sir. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, so I think I've been asked, you know, I think most interviews they're like, how do you, you know, how do you make a movie? Like, how does, how does somebody make a movie? <laughs> or how did you do it? You know, and, and I was like, oh, how, like, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I, I, I think, I don't know if this is the experience everyone else has had, but I just was solving every problem that I needed to solve as I went along. And then at some point it was like, oh, okay, we made it through. And then, I mean, I, and, and you guys know with distribution, like there's a whole, that's a whole nother uh, uh, bag, can of worms or whatever. So like you have to start solving those problems, especially when you're doing your first movie. And like, there's just so many problems you have to solve. Like it's almost impossible to even remember. It's like driving to work or something. Like you, you had to make all those decisions, but you don't remember each little one. You're just like, yeah, where I needed to go. Cause, it, cause if there was a, a pile of shit in the road. I went around it, you know, and then went that, Oh, this road's blocked off. Let me go down this way. Oh, going off road now. Okay. This is a metaphor working for you guys. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's simply my experience. <laughs> uh, just, no, but I, but honestly, I really had that, that thought when I finished a fat and I was like, I don't know how I just did that. Like, I don't even know. How, like, do I remember the skills that I developed when yeah. I, I knew some of them I did, but others I'm like, I, I'm just going to have to f come up to that problem again and probably figure out another way to solve it because there's no way I remember. I also remember one other thing I was thinking about this other day because I'm, I'm deep in editing and uh, on a couple other projects and, and I'm finally at that stage where it's like, I'm spending hours and hours editing and I really love that stage. It's hard to get there and it's also hard to have the the space to do it if that makes sense but man it's so like rewarding it's it's uh how do you say uh, like it's rewarding but you're you're making like ten thousand decisions when you make a movie because like you're deciding all the top level stuff like the story but then all of a sudden you're like let me move this over two frames okay no no back two frames oh that music cue needs just two oh, just a second longer and so, like, at, when you've gone through it, you've you've made like ten decisions at least. I have to imagine uh, on a movie like that or more. And so it's a it's a lot of shit. So I mean, anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. It's just making movies is hard. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you all make a boatload of decisions. Uh, just a reminder for anyone in the chat: um, if you have any questions, uh, we just start uh, starts on your way. And Chris Ball, if you see a good one, bring it to the screen. And until then, I'll, I'll just keep chatting myself. I'll just, uh, I'll keep yabbing until we get to the end of it. So if anyone, anyone listening, uh, give us some good questions for these folks. Uh, here's your chance. 
Um, and before we, why would we wait on that? Um, so like, you know, with, uh, we're talking about this, uh, the DIY scene, uh, that do it yourself, which really means do it together. Uh, this question for all of you, actually, um, what, how, how did you, um, uh, how did you build your coalition of like those who were willing to help you? Um, Scott, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I was lucky enough to have a relationship with, uh, my pal, Jim saw who's a phenomenal, uh, documentary, uh, photographer. And, and I just pitched the idea to him and, um, and it took a little convincing and, um, and then, you know, we had some conversations and, um, many, 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 um, cocktails. And, and we, 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 um, <laughs> we figured it out and, uh, it worked really, you know, he, he's, he's a great guy and, and we worked it out together. Um, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't Jim's fault. It just wasn't, as you know, I mean, doing one of these things is very challenging and it's very, um, you know, you get, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of it coming, you know, you think, oh, okay, I got this whole chapter done. And then someone calls you and says, uh, yeah, no, you can't, you can't use that footage and you got to go. Okay. But you know, I, I done, a ma I, I hate to keep coming back to this, but I'd done a magazine and fanzines and all that, all of which you did a magazine. <laughs> all, of magazine stuff? <laughs> all of which, um, <laughs> why don't you tell us? Mention it. I haven't mentioned it yet. So <laughs> all, of, all of which, um, mean that, uh, you, you mentioned it one time. I think one time. I think at oh, least one time. Okay. Um, at least but, twice, oh, maybe. Okay, I'll let you talk. I'm sorry. Okay, fuck off. <laughs> so, um, but I think that um, a lot of, if I hadn't had that, like, I think doing a doc would be harder for me because I got used to things changing on a dime like boom like oh can't use that photograph shit we i gotta find another photograph oh that half page ad fell out okay now we gotta fill this space so all those problems that you have when you're doing a publication aren't all that dissimilar from when you're doing a documentary because you know you run into the same kind of problems i mean we all know right like you've got this great photo that you want to use. And then all of a sudden, you know, either you, someone comes, you know, you, you go to the photographer and you say, Hey, I'd like to use this photo. And then they say, uh, sure. You can use it for a thousand dollars and go, I can't afford that. And then they say, well, fuck off. So, uh, or, you know, you want to use a piece of music and it's just too expensive. So you, sure. you're, you're constantly having to like, oh, yeah. always have plan B's plan B plan C's and, you know, plan D's. So all of that is DIY. All of that is, is mm. all stuff that you learn. But I, I also think that. Yes. I was going to say, I agree that uh, those problems, by having to solve those problems, sometimes you have to come up with creative solutions. Yeah. So it ends and up, do you end up have doing something that maybe you wouldn't have? That's right. Puppets, and for instance, sometimes they're better than the one <laughs> you had before. You know, mm -hmm. John, do you have any uh, examples of that when you're making the anti flag documentary? Um, not not a ton, just because we kind of restricted it to our score and like anti flags music. There's only one opportunity where we could have had uh, like music we would have had to pay a bunch of money for, and that's mm -hmm. Rage Against the Machine. Um, but I felt like using the music video would have been fine enough, and then that falls under fair use. So I guess that counts right. as like a workaround, um, right. but it was never, it was never a thing that I was like married to as an idea was to like have that music sure. come in. Cause you know, I think they just hear it in their head. You know, I mean that like Bulls on Parade is such a ubiquitous song that I think that you can kind of fill in the gap mentally. Yeah. 
And Taylor, what about you? I'm gonna get. And it's not even about. It's it, it's something that doesn't like people get it. People are gonna see Tom Morello. People are gonna see Tom Morello and and you know get get it. It's it's mm-hmm. it's because it's, it's, it's not it's not a Rage Against the Machine documentary. If you were raising, you were doing a Rage Against the Machine documentary and you didn't have couldn't get the songs, you're kind of fucked. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. But uh, with working with the band, I mean, the, your biggest hurdle is getting those songs licensed. And it, since it's the band, I'm doing that one with the uh, Wilhelm guys, and uh, almost all the music we're using is Wilhelm's versions or stuff like that. So like, oh my god, I don't have to worry about any of that. And almost all the photographs and stuff we're using, they shot so. Uh, like, which is a completely different thing with the fat rec doc, but um, uh, Taylor, you probably had a clearer bunch of stuff. Yeah, it sucks. I did though. I would get married to something and be like, "Oh, I love this sequence with this uh, song or this photo," and then you know, be depressed for a week when I had to change it out or yeah. Or, or, you know, our Kickstarter did pretty well. So I did pay the photographers what they asked. And I still don't think it was worth it. But here we are. <laughs> yeah, the music, I, as someone told me. I, I we have, we... What? Oh, what? Ahead, Scott. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, I didn't mean to. Uh, oh, I was, was going to say, I, I was sorry, sorry. Sorry, I was gonna say uh, we were we we're gonna we tr- we asked for uh, beat on the back. We had a, like a small under song that underneath that we used because Mike talked about the Ramones, and we we uh, I, I reached out to see how much it would be, and they're like, they they said only two grand, like which is an insanely cheap, yeah. it's a great deal. amount of money for a very good. such a big song. But I said, <laughs> sorry, no, I'm not gonna pay for that. <laughs> I cut it out. <laughs> it's it was like underneath something. It didn't even like play a pro. It didn't. Sure, you, yeah. didn't you got the idea. You, it wasn't needed. So I was like, no, I'm not two grand. I mean, oh my god, two grand. That, that's how much the puppets cost. You know, like <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah, the, the music publishing. Uh, I I I think uh, with the the current film that I just finished, uh, the which is uh, a documentary about pre magazine. Um, which if you're not from, you know, familiar with, um, really it's heyday was in the 1970s and they were number two to Rolling Stone in terms of sales and, uh, newsstand and everything else. But to me personally, they, they, uh, established and created, um, really kind of a, I don't know, um, a baseline for you know how music criticism should be written um so you're talking about lester bangs you're talking about you know nick tashes you're talking about um you know uh, uh richard Meltzer, uh grill marcus uh you know you name it and so um you know we um the music that we chose, the the film starts with an Iggy song because I knew it's a, it's a film. The magazine is based in Detroit. OK. And, and, and it begins in the in the late 1960s. And you cannot, or at least in my mind, you cannot have a film like this. That starts around that and not have an Iggy pop song. Uh at some point in the film. And that song cost us more than my first car. And your first car? <laughs> uh, well, first car was uh, like 300 bucks, but still. Um, <laughs> it cost, that, that song cost you $300. I can't believe that they, they, they ripped you off, man. No, no, it was, it was considerably more than that. But, um, but you know (laughs) sometimes you just have to uh you just got to bite the bullet and just go you know so i had all these i had had explosions in the sky i had you know i had like my perfect soundtrack and you know i think it was taylor that said like you know you can't someone told me very early early on don't get too married to anything and I think this was, was actually with with Saladay's, I think. Yeah. 
um, yeah. you know, any scene, any music, any whatever. And so I never, I never forgot that. And I had, there's one scene in the film that if you saw it originally, it had explosions in the sky. And when I watched that scene every single fucking time, I got goosebumps and we had to replace it. And, but it turned out fine. It's okay. It's all good. But, you know, um, I think if, if there's anything I can say, not that anyone's asking, but if there's anything I can say is to not just try not to get too attached to any one particular scene or song or because anything can happen, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I understand. Can re- like, like it's uh it's um i think that killing your darlings man you got to be ready to do it even if it's not something you can't get access to if it doesn't serve the story or if it doesn't you know uh if it just doesn't your your flow of the film because something you can love and just really is a cool thing you can just you can feel it sometimes when it just fucks mm-hmm. up the the flow of the movie you feel like For all sure. of a sudden you should feel yeah. it it's like oh this this is dragging we had right. a we had a little bit of a you know in the fat rec doc uh we have that uh, animated sequence and i when i had it made hand drawn i was like i'll do 45 seconds and when we got into it you know some uh, one of the guys who were editing with they were like it's too long we got to cut it i'm like i'm not cutting that <laughs> it's not cutting it and we didn't cut it it's 45 seconds um and it's cuz the rest of the movie is so everyone talking all the time and it's a lot of like fast sequences it's like this moment where you should get to go for a ride and the whole idea is supposed to be a trip sequence so i wanted people to be you know like all of a sudden the movie just takes this angle and you're like where are we going where are we going where are we going and you're like and it's so long that you're gonna have to sit in it for a minute the theater the sex and because it's got like really cool sound design that takes pieces from early in the movie and it stretches them out and slows them and the <laughs> and then, and then yeah. it comes back and all of a sudden you're back in the store and you're moving again. And I, yeah. and I mean, and, and the, the thing, the, the reaction I've gotten from everybody as almost everybody's like, Oh, it's even the people who are against 45 seconds, they came back and they're like, no, it, 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 it I, I, you know, but you know, yeah, I, I, I did a version where I cut it down. I was, I was like, no, the, each one of those frames was hand drawn. I think it's like 16 frames a second, 45 seconds. That's a lot of drawing. Yeah, that is. Hell yeah. I, think, I think I know that scene too, by the way. But yeah, that's it. Uh, so, uh, in the interest of time, um, we, let's we're going to move into our uh, Q and A, our Q and A section of the uh, of the of the the event this evening. Scott suck. So far, John, you haven't flipped anyone off yet. So we got to find a way to. Uh, uh, That's a uh, real Taylor. Tragedy. Like Taylor, that. you have to know. I that was me. I made that. I know. <laughs> That's because that, I yeah. want to take you down a peg because you're you're such talk, a better filmmaker than me. I'm like I got talk about just songs. You know, I, gotta, I, I gotta go have my movie. <laughs> That is one of the songs we could not what, get. They wouldn't give it to you? No. You you made that connection and they were like, nah. Unless it was for a lot of money. So you oh, know. that's right. Yeah. So Every once in a while, the punk rockers are kind of the assholes. I believe that. <laughs> oh. uh, so, uh, if any, uh, let's uh, pull up some QA from the audience. All right. Oh, Sonetta. Um, <laughs> Sonetta is um, of uh, QA. Uh, how did you all reach out to approach all the artists? This is for everyone. Uh, shout out to Sonetta. We actually met. There's a wonderful Facebook group called Friends of Streetlight Manifesto. And it is the most wonderful group of people that I... It, uh, it, it's the rare time that Facebook is actually nice. So I recommend you all join it. And uh, I know her and I are actually going to be working on a project coming up pretty soon. So uh, this is uh, Taylor, you're on the screen. How this, we'll start with Taylor. Uh I reached out to artists a million different ways. Some people I still had connections to from the the old days, but a lot it was emails to managers and Facebook messages. And actually, I approached uh, Tom from Streetlight Manifesto backstage at one of his shows, and he was like, "I don't, I don't do documentaries. I don't do interviews." Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> no, for the most part, it was cold calls. And then when we would wrap up an interview. 
you know, you'd be packing up and you'd say, oh, thank you so much person from some band for doing this interview. Um, you know, do you know anybody else that we should get in touch with? And they'd be like, um, sure. Yeah. Let me connect you to my friend from this band. Uh, you know, and I had them, it would be like, here's this famous person's phone number, but you can't tell them where you got it. And I'm like, well, then I can't use the phone number. What am I going <laughs> to, because the first question is, how'd you get this number? But uh, yeah, it was a lot of word of mouth and a lot of just cold calling and hoping people wanted to be in a movie. And for the most part, you know, some people didn't and that's fine. Oh, awesome. Uh, let's uh, jump to you, John. Same question. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we were initially offered uh, the opportunity to do this. I mean, if we wanted to turn it into something and once I decided that it was worth doing, like I, it was something I was really interested in doing specifically because of the political angle. Um, we had to do like a whole proposal. I wanted to make sure that we were like a top notch professional when we were talking to Antiflag about it, considering it's like making the permanent record of their career on like video and uh, they were down. And so, I mean, it, it really wasn't hard to get the interviews, you know, I mean, we, they basically just reached out feelers to anyone they thought would be interested. And then we get, we did the interviews that we thought would be uh, the most rewarding, like have the most overlap or name value or like, like the best spoken people. Um, and so it, it was pretty smooth. It was just more a matter of like, everyone in our crew has like a full-time job. And so it was a lot of just like shooting on nights and weekends, a lot of like late night drives to get to places. Um, and mostly just kind of waiting around until people came like within like, you know, a six hour radius. Damn. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Scott, same question. Um, with me, I, I sort of, it was a little bit of a different approach. Um, I would just send cash. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and hope for the best and uh yeah how did ian respond to that oh Positively. oh no i know he's a good bribe no 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 i'm kidding but no um no i i basically just reached out you know just like everyone else on this panel and 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 said look this is what i'm trying to do um love to have you be a part of it and um and uh you know, if you want to know more, let's get on the phone. So there's a lot of, you know, some of them were just like, sure, yeah, let's do it, whatever, show up at this time and and we'll do it. And others wanted to know more, um, which I understood. And uh, and we just talked and, you know, we just um, communicated and I just told them what I was looking for. And I I don't know if it was my pitch. I don't know what it was, but... Um, you know, they always tell you to come up with a 30 second pitch. I think mine was more like 30 minutes, but I think, um, <laughs> that, um, we were able to, uh, I guess in the case of salad days, um, I was able, it was a lot easier in the case of cream. Um, these are people that I didn't know. I didn't have personal relationships with Alice Cooper or with, Gene Simmons or Kirk Hammett or whoever, or Michael Stipe. But, um, but you know, it all, it, it all apply. I mean, it's all the same. It's like, you know, you just, ba you know, you basically just have to say like, you know, here's what I want to do and be as honest and transparent as you can be and hope that, that they, um, uh, they come on board. So. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Hey, uh, Sean, uh, same question. I'd say uh, you have to have the audacity to reach out to people, but most people, if you're polite and you're kind and they have, and it's something that you can make super easy for them to do, uh, they'll do it. I mean, some people are more helpful than others, um, but other, some and it also depends on who you get. I, I always see it as like a little bit of a ladder, like you get each rung. So if you get this certain, if you get these two people in your movie, and then you go to this third person who knows the two people or is either good friends with them. They're like, oh, yeah, of course. Or if it's somebody that they highly respect and they would like to be in a movie with that person, you know. Yeah. Um, that happened I think on the pod doc. That's helped a lot. Once we got uh, Ira Glass, a lot of people, you know, were, were, yeah. were talking to us um, with with uh, the fat rec doc. Once we got Mike, I mean, everyone would talk to us because, I mean, yeah. the fat Mike is doing it. 
which uh, which uh, I had a unique situation. Uh, you know, earlier I mentioned that I had done that recording with Joey Cape, and the story goes, um, I get an email. This is about a year or two after we had done the recording, and there was some back and forth with the email because you know mixing notes and things like that. But um, we weren't didn't have like a deep friendship or anything. You know, he was just you know he was a cool guy. We recorded a thing. We had we you know, worked together on this thing. It was great. But two years later, I get an email that out of the blue that's like, hey, do you want to play guitar for Lagwagon? And uh, it wasn't meant for me. It was meant for a different Sean, the Sean that used to play with them. Um, and so I kind of I, I emailed back. Uh, I, I emailed back right away. And uh, hey, Joey, I'd be love to play gar- guitar for you guys, but I don't think it's meant for me. <laughs> but the thing of about the email is that it was a me first in the gimme gimme's thread so it had everybody's email on it it had fat mike's email it had chris shiflet from the Foo fighters it had you know all the rest of the guys and uh, i played in a band and had a studio and i think a less disciplined person or maybe an idiot would email them like hey fat mike sign my band uh I did not do that. I just didn't think that was kosher, especially how I got it. And I kind of felt entrusted with it in a way because it had mistakenly been given to me. But the people who sent it to me sent it, you know, I was because I was in somebody that he he would trust, you know, if that would make sense, hopefully. Absolutely. Uh, but as I as I decided to do the fat rec doc, that which was kind of independent of all that, I just had the idea to do it. And because I had known Joey, I figured, well, I'll, you know, uh, I'll eventually reach out to Joey, but before I even did, I think even before I reached out to Joey, I just w- had started making the movie because it was just going to be like a 20 minute short kind of thing. It wasn't going to be a big feature. And what we, what I did was I put the, went to Las Vegas. I di- did some filming. I, uh, my initial interviews were all just re reaching out on Twitter. Uh, uh, I just, went to their Twitter of people who were at the punk rock bowling, saw comedians were there and some people. I was like, Hey, I'm working on this punk fat records thing. Would you do an interview? And I think I got, I had just set up the Twitter and it got shut down. I don't even know why. Cause I didn't add that many people, but uh, it shut down. So I only got to send out like uh, those two or three tweets. But from that, uh, Joe Sib, you know, uh, I'm going to go to Southern California. You know the song. Uh, sure. He agreed to do one. So there's somebody There's somebody who is somebody in that world who's agreed to do yeah. it. Um, you know, and, and so so that happened. So I, put, I take that, I put a trailer together, a little teaser, which you guys can see on the Fat Rec, um, the Fat Rec.com. There's, we have all our, our early stuff and the first teasers there. And I put, I put it together. And, um, I'm, I'm I'm coming back from Las Vegas, and I'm the marketing director of this talent development school. And we were doing an event. We were flying in all these record producers to judge these uh, like teeny bopper kids. So I fly back from Las Vegas, uh, having getting those interviews, and I look on the list of people that I got to pick up in the airport, and because I'm running I'm running the show there, and one of them's Ryan Green, which I had completely glossed over when I was putting together the event. And I just happened to be like Ryan Green. He did, uh, for those who've seen the movie and those who knew Fat Records, Ryan Green uh, was like, co-owned a studio with Fat Mike. He produced and recorded all the first Fat Records sure, albums. Sure, yeah. and I was awesome. Man. So the, the timing was, I mean, that, that how, that's kismet. There's not, that's act like that is so, I mean, there's other ways the movie could have could have got made. Yeah, but of course. How crazy is that? It's yeah. just insane. It's utterly insane. And so, um, to, to make uh, a so long story longer, to, to make yeah. a long story longer, I, uh, I, uh, that happened. So I have this really great trailer. I got like, you know, Ryan Green, this guy who was actually made fat records, uh, you know, a couple guys from California. I put the t- teaser out, but before I do, I'm like, I should probably say something to fat records about this. Cause at this point I had not talked to anybody. I just started shooting and started making it. You know, I didn't expect it to be anything, uh, significant. But I, after I put together the first teaser, I it, I was like, man, this is I, I should. It, this is a good reason to use that email. Now I'll reach out to Fat Mike because yeah. this is a reason to use that email. Yeah. Doesn't matter where I got the email at this point. If I'm reaching out about a documentary and I have something shot for it, yeah, you know, this is the time. If I'm going to use it, this is the time to pull the trigger. It, 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 and I did. I, I sent it to him, 
Did I was I like, hey, I'm putting this out tomorrow. <laughs> I was, but I don't think I don't think I was asking permission. I was just like, hey, I'm putting this out tomorrow. I thought sure. you should see it. Excellent. Uh, and he's like, looks cool. He's like, a, like a email back from from Mike. Looks cool. So I was like, oh, that's. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. And there's a you know a lot a lot more stuff that happened. It's not not exactly how things played out, but just that initial thing. I'm just like the movie wanted to exist. Like those things, you know what I mean? If that makes any kind of sense. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And if Mike would have shut it down, if Mike would have shut it down, it would have been over, you know. So anyway, that's my little tale. Oh, thank you, Sean. Um, so just uh, I actually want to ask this all of you guys, just for the interest of time, because I know we're kind of running a little bit over. Um, we have some more Q and A in the audience, but we can also wrap it up. I just know if anyone has a, should we do we have enough time to do at least one more? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to take too much shit. I have nothing else to be doing, so yeah. uh, uh, fuck me, Chris. I gotta go. I gotta go, man. I, I don't have time to stay here and chat with these <laughs> punk rock doc filmmakers. I know we got at least Lord three people to so, you. So balls, like my give us a good one. <laughs> Uh, do any of you filmmakers have juicy stories of stuff that was too risque to put in your documentaries? I uh, that great Ooh, question. Great question. Uh, thank, you, Ed, uh, thank you, Carrie. That was that, that's my favorite question. So, so far. I to go first. Yeah, I'm not going to answer it, but it's a really great question. Yeah. I like, <laughs> <laughs> Man, if I could answer that question, it would be a great answer. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a great question. Uh, um, so, John, I'm sure you probably have nothing, no juice. Yeah, honestly, no, not really. I mean, it would be with Antifly, it's kind of you see what you get, you know. No, is it the Sky Guys, Taylor, or those, or the Blockbuster people? Were there some some fun shit in there you could tell us? I mean, there were a lot of people in both movies that, as soon as the camera stopped, would say, you know, yeah, but the real story is blah 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 blah. And right. a, I don't remember it because I just remember the stories that I watched a hundred times during editing. Right. And, and B, they told me not to tell you, so this is on the internet. What is <laughs> Yeah. I want to make more movies in the future. You gotta keep that trust. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and for me, you're talking, you know, you may or may not be familiar with Cream Magazine, but um they were really the sort of sex drugs rock and roll. It was like imagine like National Lampoon mixed with Rolling Stone. And with a little bit of Mad Magazine and cocaine. So that was cream. So um, were there juicy stories? Yes. Um, We included some in the film. Some some will just, I will take to my grave. But... (laughs) um, but, uh, but they were very, uh, you have to watch the film. And there are a lot of them in the film. Uh, but, you know, you have to remember these, eh, I, I'll keep it short. This was uh, a magazine where the staff lived uh, together 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a commune. Um, and they were men and women living together, creating a magazine every month. So I'll, I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Some, nice. some children were probably born. I'll tell you this. I have, uh, I have uh, audio because we had Mike lapped up and there's a point where he goes to the bathroom and then you hear him go to the bathroom. Then you hear him, uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not a shocking revelation, but he was doing surprise. He was doing some cocaine. Um, well, at least the sound, if he, he might've been fucking with us. You never know. You know what I mean? But, uh, he definitely went down there and we, we heard all the noise cause we're all hooked up. He's like, choo, 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 choo. and that's, that's, uh, recorded. So I have that recorded, but, uh, that's, that's, it didn't make any sense to put it in the movie. So it's not something right. I would have put in the movie, but, yeah, um, it's, it. you know, it's a funny, we kind of did, you know? Oh man, we should have used that real sound. Damn it. No, <laughs> cause it was in a bathroom. So it wouldn't have sounded right for the scene. Like it just, it like. Uh, but yeah, that's a the, uh, that's a good answer to that question, though, right? Oh, Carrie, thank you for so much for that question. That that was wonderful. Uh, I think we, Paul, we got anyone else? Any other questions in there, Chris Paul? Hey, I think I we got think one my, more. I think we got one more question. My buddy Richard Gill. Richard, oh, hey, hey, Richard, thank you so Woo! much uh, for everyone. How is how important is it for you for the process to see your film with an audience? 
Do you gauge festival or early screening reactions for final editing, or do you ignore all that and just make the film you want to see? So I think Richard should be hosting this next, right? Because damn, this is a good question. That's um, great. Jealous. We should talk to him. We should reach John. out. We should reach out. We, we, reach out. Yeah. Maybe he'll co-host. Maybe he'll co-host one with us. Yeah. Did yeah. I just get fired? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> oh, hey. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll go first, and I'll so that other people can talk. Uh, I was going to say, like, we did uh, for our. I totally believe in test screenings. I, I think, I, I think it's yeah. good to test. Uh, screening with people who know kind of know the material and then test screening with people who like have absolutely no connection with the material to make sure and getting the feedback about uh whether or not scenes are working and everything's understood and it you know because you know and you can also tell when there's an energy in the room when things are working and you can feel the lulls as you can feel it's it's uh it's not something you can put your finger on but uh i think i'm all about knowing people and just verifying that they're getting what i'm wanting to convey no yeah i'm i'm with you sean i mean i think i've done enough of these things where they're not like you know official sort of like test screenings but they are early screenings where i'm just getting a sense of like what works what you know what i might think is funny does anyone else think is funny you know so uh, or what I think is dramatic. Does anyone else? Or I mean, it's bad if you think something something's dramatic and people are laughing. You know, you just have to go. Oh, okay. So um, no, I I I find them invaluable. And um, and it, you know, um, Richard, I think uh, even after. Well, I wasn't there. Unfortunately, I had to I had to rush home, but. Um, but I think even after this, the version that I gave Sound Unseen, I mean, I was, we were editing way, like up and literally until the last day before we gave it to our distributor. And a lot of that was based on audience feedback. And uh, so, no, I, I, I find it uh, very useful. It's part of the process. It's just part of the process. Exactly. For me. Yeah. What about you, John? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's super important. Uh, I hate watching stuff with people. Like it makes me <laughs> nauseous. I have bad anxiety to begin with. Um, I have to go in the bathroom and cry. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's kind of like how I feel. So I end up just like yeah. slumping in my seat. Yeah. Uh, but that said, no, I think it's super important. Um, and I'm definitely about, uh, like really harsh feedback. Like give me like point by point by point react, like your emotional reaction to things. Uh, like I love that kind of thing. I just hate like experiencing it with people. It's um, tough. It's yeah, fair. yeah. I would rather get like a detached like uh, like laundry list of notes that's yeah, like the size I, of a book than like sit there with it. But but I think both are important because I think that there are things you can pick up by looking at people or just feeling like their body posture change or, or anything like that. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's what helps me is I, I I scan the audience and I watch the body language and I go. Okay, yeah, that one bombed. Mm -hmm. Or, or so it, the the funny thing is, and I don't know if this has happened to you guys, but sometimes to think that you're the stuff you're like, mm, I th I mean, I think it's funny, but I don't. Know. The stuff we it, the audience reacts great to it. So um, to me, it's watching the physical reaction, and um, you know, I'm not sure how I would do if I got you know, 10 pages worth of notes, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd probably curl up in a fetal position, you know, position somewhere. But I'm starting, uh, to, I'm starting to sense a, a theme here with you, Scott. Are you all right, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good, man. You know what? The is, good is, is, are, are movies abusing you? Are you being abused? <laughs> is it an abusive partner? No, you know what? I only make like, I, I've made two films in eight years. So that's not bad. I curl up. I in a no, you know, a cry, and it's only once every four years. I mean, that's not bad, right? If you're not if you're not crawl, crawling in a fetal position and crying, are you really making a movie? No, no, no. no. Or I don't you think you are. I remember crying in the shower. I remember oh, crying in the shower. Movie? Yeah, you're making. We were, we were. Uh, we were. We were. We had to make it to the. Uh, the we did a test screening in San Francisco because the fat twenty five, and so we had to kind of like. We were, I mean, I was editing at truck stops 
and like yeah. trying to render on the way there. I think we had literally an like if we didn't get the movie rendered in an hour. We weren't going to get it to the theater and we wouldn't have a test screening. I mean, it was right. down to the wire like that and we we're editing. I mean, it was just fucking. And then I remember after the edit happened and we got it delivered, I went and took a shower and I started just fucking crying. I hadn't slept. I had, I had not slept for three days. I'd stayed yeah. up the entire trip out to California editing along. We would stop. And then we, we stayed at a, ga- uh, a truck stop for five hours so I could edit. Yep. She's out. <laughs> uh, Taylor, uh, like, same question. And I cried like a, like a, like a little baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah, I did not cry like you. Is that because <laughs> it's about Scott? Because <laughs> it's about Scott. It's all happy. No, no. <laughs> Either. I made that up. So it's all it's all Richard. I mean, it's all uh, Sean. Well, Sean? Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, um, I'm not making that up. I, 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 had a, I, had a, I had a breakdown, but I hadn't slept for three days. So that had a lot to do with it. No, I did. I had 47 of them. So, yeah. 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 Now, I think seeing a movie with an audience is is huge it's the for me like i didn't really do test screenings i did all that through email and got the 10 pages of notes but theaters and film festivals and seeing it with audiences is by far the best part and i can't sit and watch the movie either i'll pace around and just watch people but the docs i've done i try to make them funny you know i like comedy more than tragedy so i do put a lot of jokes in and so that feeling you get in a crowded theater when everybody laughs at one of yeah. your dumb jokes that's, that's love it that's like the highest that's like playing a, a show you yeah. know and it is actually it's so like playing a show and the you're not, it's like a detached honor. playing a show because you're not playing the show you're like detached right, right. from watching your you're watching, watching you play you but you, what, yeah it's, it's, but a, it is it's, that it's such a cool experience. And the, it's a very the dance puppet kind of feeling too. Right. But the huge bummer like, of 2020 you're laughing, you're like, God. John and I are putting out, John and Scott and I, right? I don't know if anybody's doing theaters this year, but uh, he's not right now sucks. We've done, we've done some theater. We've done a fair amount of theaters. Okay. But yeah, it's been, it's been tough. I mean, it's, uh, Certainly not what we had planned. And, yeah. uh, we had planned over 200 theaters. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a real, real huge fun. bummer. Yeah. We got to do a couple of drive-ins and it's yeah. cool, but it's That's totally cool. different. You yeah. can't hear people laughing. All you get is like some flashing lights and honking horns at the end. And it's like, I guess yeah. they liked it. I don't know. Right. right. But, uh, Yeah. This uh, this COVID thing and trying to be an independent filmmaker, it's hard and it's worse and it's it's dumber. Oh. I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I think <laughs> that that's why we ended up like we're just self releasing ours. Um, yeah, and I, we felt like that was the best way to go because there aren't a lot of distribution companies trying to buy a new slate of films when they're just sitting on this year's roster like that they yeah. didn't put out. Right. Um, and then at the same time, like I mean, I'm sure you guys know the reality of like you never know what you're going to get with the distribution company. I mean, like a lot of times you're not ever going to see money from that, especially if they don't pay you up front. And so like to make this thing valuable, I felt right. like just try to get the most word of mouth we can put it out direct and like make as much as we can on it to try and like slingshot into another project. Once we're able to film again more easily. I think that's, yeah. I'm going to keep my mouth shut on the distribution stuff. <laughs> I think what you just said is exactly um the way to do it and i think you'll actually i could be wrong but i think you'll actually be shocked at how well you do yeah i I mean man yeah i I mean it's hard to it's hard to tell you know because right now we're just doing the premiere um i and it's doing it's doing pretty well ticket sales wise but you know i don't know what the longevity of this is going to be like i i think that it was very important to me to get this out before the election yeah uh, for sure obviously Uh, because of how hyper political everything is, uh, yeah. but I think, I, yeah, this like <laughs> <laughs> I voted last year. So oh my god, <laughs> oh, it's just like I saw a tweet earlier today, and I thought it just nailed it. It was just like, "Fuck you, 2020, for having a three act structure." Plot <laughs> 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 twist uh, after plot twist. Yeah, as of, as of yeah, as of, yeah, like last night at what two a.m. Uh, like, dude, it was just like oh oh god, dude, <laughs> wait. 
Wait, there, second, there's I so close. many plot twists. There's so many plot twists in 2020. It, it's, it's like the show got canceled. You know, like the end of a series when they're like, they know they got canceled. They just throw yeah. everything at the wall. It's Ryan That's Murphy putting a bunch of guest appearances on. Yeah. yeah. Dude, Rick Moranis got randomly attacked. <laughs> Rick Moranis. What is going you know, on? Remember that tomorrow. <laughs> he just disappeared for 20 years and this is what he gets. Right? He comes out and he gets punched in the face. Be like, it, like oh man. So which uh, one of these I'm glad, I'm glad that stayed apolitical though. And that's still we still stayed apolitical. I, I, I that's uh, we didn't mention any particular pre- people except Rick Moranis. That's great. Who, which one of you is who? Which one of you is going to make the Rick Moranis documentary? Yeah, definitely Taylor. Right? We all look at you, Taylor. But yep, <laughs> that tracks. Oh, everyone! Uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, for for doing this this evening. So we're going to kind of get to the wrapping up of it. Um, I thank you for anyone who's joining. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Um, it sure feels like the future is going to be doing more of these types of things for independent filmmakers. So let's all try to support them. I know we're all, I'm definitely going to, should definitely be there tonight for, uh, for, for John's, uh, for John's. Yeah. Tomorrow. Go to John's tomorrow. T- tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. tomorrow. Ready to go. John's John. here. Oh, Woo! You. <laughs> you know, I think this is a proof that, you know, you really can't just do like, yeah, we don't know. No one does anything alone and no, we don't have our physical scenes like we used to, but our, the digital ones are, you know, it's not as good, but this is still, uh, it still feels really special. Um, so before this, we wrap I, up, let's let I was go say, I don't think, I don't think I would have been able to connect with all these guys like this. I don't know if we would have, we would have made the time. And so I want to, I appreciate you and your whole team, uh, especially Mr. Chris Ball behind the scenes there. He's been doing all the switches Ooh, and playing the yeah. videos and, uh, and like I get a chance to, so I, I I don't know if yeah, I would have got Chris a chance Paul. to hang out with these guys like this. So. Oh, he's there. There he is. Woo. There's Chris Paul, everyone. See Paul. See Paul. Um, but so I want to thank I want to thank uh, the team for 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 doing this, and also thanking all the the filmmakers, uh, the, my buddies, uh, for hanging out. I'm I'm glad we got to do this, and I, I, this is the second time I got to spend some time with John. So I'm I'm really stoked about that. So, um, anyway, sorry I didn't mean to to take it. No, really Sean, I was going to ask everyone to kind of wrap up. Um, where can people find you online? Oh. <laughs> and more importantly, what's going on for the future? What are your next projects? Like, uh, where can people interact with you? And then we'll go around. And um, also, just anyone in the, the chat as well. Um, uh, Sean actually is the, the brainchild behind this. who put this together. So, hey, thank you, Sean. Um, we want to do this again. So let us know who you want to hear. Punk rock documentaries, non-punk rock documentaries. Like, let's do some roundtables, people. Let's, uh, we're here. And uh, we got a podcast over at Let's Chat. If any of you uh, guests are looking to talk in more depth. So I'm sure we'll all be in touch at some point. But yes, well, Sean, it is up. Okay, I am uh, Open Ended Films. That's uh, the website, the Twitter, the Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, I'm working on a uh, a podcast documentary that has uh, Ira Glass and uh, Roman Mars, uh, Avery Truffleman, uh, Kevin Smith is in it too. Um, uh, that's hopefully sometime next year it'll be coming out. Uh, we're in deep in post uh there's a, i've edited together a few scenes together and it's i'm really excited about it um so yeah also i have a a series and a a, a film and a series called lifer one's a, a feature length film and then we've adapted uh parts of it that didn't make into the film into a five-part um series about um uh it's actually like uh, in john's movie he he uh spoiler alert he goes to the family's homes um and kind of talks to the parents and we kind of do that in with the lifer doc but it's all that it's really just all the parents and the families and all the support systems so yeah lifer and age of audio um open-ended films oh yeah excellent um scott let's go next uh where can people find you online what are your future projects well i've got so my latest film which is called cream america's only rock and roll magazine is now streaming on amazon um iTunes, Fandango, you name it. Um, and we're at currently uh, 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, nice. uh, 98% audience response on Rotten Tomatoes. So, Ooh, so we're, 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 I'm really excited about that. We've gotten some amazing press. Tomorrow I'll be on CBS Saturday morning um, talking about the film with uh, Alex Cooper. So that's, holy shit! Sorry. That's sweet man, it's so, it with yeah. us at first, huh? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for uh, stepping down to our level. <laughs> so, 
so that'll be that'll be uh that's the next thing and then uh or that's the current thing and then i'm working on sort of uh i was just asked and i started to work on it but then um it fell apart because of uh one of the um people uh bailed because of uh uh covid but i was asked to do a uh treatment for a husker du documentary Ooh. so uh i've been working on that as well as another documentary on um not so much uh doa doa were you know punk band sean helped me with this a uh, doa is a you know iconic punk band from vancouver influenced everybody uh from 1980 on but it's more about uh the singer of doa joe keithley who's now a council member uh in vancouver oh the green party correct that's correct yes an elected green party member so the film will follow him as he goes through the next election what win or lose so it'll be sort of a fly on the wall kind of documentary which is what i've always wanted to make and then um i've got um another um uh fiction movie that um that i'll be producing uh in the coming weeks uh i'll start working on that in the in the coming weeks and that's and then i need to um take a vacation for a year and then <laughs> where i'm at right. so yeah Right. I'm sure you'll do that. <laughs> well, I'll try. Yeah, sure. Hey, so tell, um, so tell, where, where can people find you online, and what what do you got in the works? I know you have a uh, black the last blockbuster is your next as well. But what else you got going on? Yeah, I've noticed a lot of people like to say lackluster. Did I say as that a, <laughs> as an accidental abbreviation? But I'm going to stick with it. It's it's a lackluster documentary. Um, no, so the <laughs> summer. <laughs> Ska Movie, we're at Ska Movie on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and yeah, skamovie.com is on Amazon Prime. Sure. Um, and then the last blockbuster is kind of coming out now. We're at the, the Lemley Theater virtually. We're doing some drive-ins, and then uh, it hits digital December 15th. Cool. Uh, Blu-rays Ooh. and DVDs are available for pre-order at benblockbuster.com. It's a blockbuster exclusive DVD. It's the first one since 2010. Whoa, you did that. That's so cool. That, that's go. a fun documentary about Blockbuster Video, and it's got also Kevin Smith in it, um, like Sean and a bunch of other great comedians and <laughs> actors and whatnot. Passing around Kevin Smith like he's a dirty whore. You know, <laughs> he likes movies. Um, he's got a dirty mouth. He'll put his mouth on any documentary. <laughs> yeah. He kind of works. I'm... Popmotionpictures.com at popmotionpictures is my company. And then uh, I think I've got a script I'm working on of a 80s retro sci-fi comedy. We'll see if that gets made. It's been delayed because of COVID. So um, pretty much just hoping people watch the last blockbuster. Call me. Which they so, <laughs> call me. Jim. I'm going to call Scott. He can help me produce. Yeah. Sorry, called Space Beaver. Yeah, yeah. If anyone in the audience uh, knows any finance, I get ten percent. Some... I put this together. <laughs> House always gets a taste. Chris, call me. Yeah. Any financiers or any uh, any people with that dollar dollar? You hit up these gentlemen and John. Besides uh, your premiere tomorrow, uh, what else you got? Going? I feel so bad asking that. Like you all put so much work into this. Like, oh, that's great. What's next? So <laughs> I do appreciate that you put in a lot of work into your projects, but people want to know what else you're doing because, man, we're all fans. We're fans. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I will. I'm sure with these guys too. I mean, I don't like working on one thing at a time. Like, I'm, I'm always trying to think next step ahead. Uh, so, our next thing besides this is a documentary called "Don't Fall in Love with Yourself." That's about Justin Pearson of The Locust and Dead Cross and some girls. Like, he's in one, he's in like a dozen bands um, and the San Diego noise scene. So, it's all about like the 2000, like early 2000 eras noise scene that uh, like popped up in San Diego and just kind of like how insane all of it was. Um, and then also just like him as the, the center of it. And, 
we're trying to develop a couple other projects. I give a lot of feelers out, but it's like nothing else. I'm working on some scripts right now. So we'll just see. I mean, a lot's just going to depend on like how well this anti-valley documentary does. And then we'll kind of know what we can sure. like go to next. <laughs> like what do we have to work with? Sure. Well, give us a yeah. your plug one more time for tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night, it premieres on Veeps at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then we're also doing a Q&A with me and the band afterwards. Uh, if you buy a ticket, uh, there are two packages. There's a cheaper one. That's just the movie and a Q&A. And then the other one uh, includes uh, a signed uh, double-sided poster with both poster designs on it. Um, and then uh, if you can't watch it when, during its actual premiere hours, it'll stay up there for 48 hours. Uh, so you can just kind of watch it at your leisure. Uh, and then it'll be available on VOD after that. Uh, and then as far as like my contact, uh, you can find all of our stuff at, at Turnstile Films with a Y or uh, at John Nix Film, J-O-N-N-I-X Film on everything. Uh, well, I, I can't thank you all enough for uh, for your time, for all of your hard work, Chris Ball behind the camera, uh, all of our wonderful art. Uh, Taylor, you made us a really nice flyer as well. Uh, yes, thanks, Benjamin Taylor. Design made our flyer. Sean made the trailer. Uh, shout out. Um, so I'm Chris Rebel. I host the podcast Let's Chat. It's Chris Rebel. Uh, John, your episode will be coming up very shortly. Sean's been out a couple times. Taylor Scott, yeah, I'll call you. I'll call you. Find us on the Let's Chat Podcast.net. I'm on Twitter. Facebook, Instagram, at Let's Chats Revel. And uh, hey, we did it. So uh, thank you Bye so guys. much. Thanks, guys. Then, Thanks, you know, Chris. Have right. a rest of your night. Much respect to all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, man. Inshallah. I appreciate that. They called here to tell me that you're finally dying.